Ruben and Amanda. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, members, good afternoon to our meeting of the Health and Social Care Services Subcommittee on Friday, the 2nd of July. Um, our first item on the agenda is apologies. So may I just check if there are any apologies to lodge, please? Can I send apologies for our chief executive, um, Neil Guckian, who I understand has distributed a message to uh, the committee members this afternoon. Um, he only took, took up post yesterday. Um, Chris will confirm that the message went out earlier um, to all members. Is that right, Chris? It's just gone, yes, Charlie. So hopefully you will receive that. A specific message from Neil as our incoming chief executive. I think Thank Councillor you. McCann, Stephen Thank McCann, you. also sends apologies. I think Len, you'll probably be able to confirm that that Stephen has sent apologies. And I think Anne Marie Fitzgerald is going to join us shortly. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, members. No other indications. We can we can note further apologies if we're notified in in the course of the meeting. So our next item then is to receive a nomination for the position of chair of the subcommittee, and that will fall to the Democratic Unionist Party. So Councillor Thompson, may I go to you, please? Yeah, thank you, Chief Executive. I wish to uh, nominate Councillor Deborah Erskine as the chair for the year incoming, uh, as chair of the Fermana and Oma Health and Social Care Services subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Erskine, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, everyone. And it's good to see everybody virtually. And this is the first time we're alive and kicking um, as well. So um, it's it's great to join everybody live and, and hear from the town hall. And I just want to take the opportunity, if you'll allow me, um, to thank the DUP group for allowing me to be chair um, for, for this year on this group, which is a very, very important group um, for our constituents in the district. And um, I want to thank Councillor Warrington for, for his year in uh, chair of this group who did an excellent job and um and you know during a year whenever we were still in the middle of the pandemic as well. And um I know we've various directors uh, joining us today from the Western Trust and we want to pay tribute to the work that they have done um, throughout co the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So um, we will get started um, on the items of business today. And just first of all, to take any declarations of interest. Chair. Yes, Councillor Dehan. Uh, thank you, Chair. I uh, will declare an interest as a member of the local commissioning group and also as a board member of the Southwest GP Federation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dehan. Any other declarations of interest? Councillor Warrington? Thank you, Chair, and all the best uh, for your year ahead. Uh, I would like uh, as a member of the local commissioning group as well. Thank you. Thank you. And any other declarations of interest before we move on? Just Deborah, it might be a good idea to ask Anne Marie Fitzgerald if or when she joins the meeting to declare a professional interest or whatever. Thank you. Yes, not no problem, yeah. Councillor McElduff. I'll certainly do that. Okay. So moving on then to um, item four on the agenda, which is to agree the terms of reference for the Health and Social Care Services Subcommittee. Um, it should be pretty straightforward. The only changes there, um, as you can see, are the fact that it is a subcommittee. And then in 2.1, um, under the third point, that has just been removed. Um, so can we just have a proposer and a seconder, please? Councillor Thompson. Okay, Councillor Dehan and Councillor Thompson, are you seconding? Yeah, uh, can I take this opportunity, uh, Madam Chair, to wish you all the very best in, in your term of office as the chair of this very important subcommittee. And I have pleasure in seconding the terms of reference. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And now we will move on to the next item of business, which is to receive a briefing from Western Health and Social Care Trust, including consideration of members' queries. So just to make members aware, 
that joining us today and we welcome them um, to the subgroup is Geraldine McKay, Director of Acute Services, Tom Cassidy, Director of Women and Children's Services, Catherine McDonnell, Medical Director, Catherine or Karen O'Brien, Director of Adult Mental Health and Learning Disability, Karen Hargan, Director of Human Resources, Bob Brown, Director of Primary Care and, so and Older People Services, Theresa Malloy, Director of Planning and Service Improvement, Alan Murr, Director of Strategic Capital Development, and Chris Kern, Public Affairs, Communication and Digital Man digital media manager so um thank you for joining us today and i'll let i think is it chris maybe to, um who will be um conducting the presentation thank you thank you chair um i'll leave the presentation if that's okay that's Geraldine. sorry sorry no, Gerald. sorry Geraldine. can i just take there i think councillor warrington's hand is up there could i just take him before the presentation starts oh it's down no problem, Sorry, apologies mistake. about that. Thank you, Geraldine. So thank you very much, Chair, and I wish you well, and as do all members of the Western Trust um, representation here today on your new role. <coughs> there are a number of members of CMT with us, as you have listed, um, but in the main, the presentation today will be conducted by um, Theresa Malloy, our Director of Performance and Service Improvement, Karen O'Brien, our Director of Mental Health and Learning Disability, and myself, who will cover a couple of items as well. We aim to uh, cover the members queries as far as we can within the presentation. <coughs> Excuse me. But there are two points I just want to point out. First of all, point three and point five of members queries that we would ask should be referred to the Health and Social Care Board for a response. The first is point three rules regarding registration um, regarding primary care. And point five, the oral dental health strategy post pandemic, um, the health and social care board would have responsibility for those items. So um, the agenda today will cover the update on the vaccination program um, on schedule and elective care update and an update on mental health services. And then we will take questions and answers um, from your committee. Um, there's nothing specific within the presentation today that will fall under confidential matters. However, unless something is raised within um, questions or queries, um, we may require confidential discussion. Um, I'm going to hand over to Theresa Malloy um, to provide the vaccination update to start with. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, everybody hear me OK? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, this is just a brief update uh, on the ongoing uh, COVID-19 vaccination programme, which the Trust was asked uh, in November last year to run uh, for the Western Trust area. Um, you have received briefings um, and updates on the vaccination programme at previous meetings, um, and you know that there are a number of streams to it. Uh, the early part of it was um, uh, vaccination of um, residents in nursing homes and in supported living facilities. Um, and that is all completed some time ago. Uh, our focus at the moment is uh, the, uh, the uh, vaccination programme that's mainly undertaken at our three mass vaccination centres across the trust geography, uh, one in Oma and one in Enniskillen in relation to, um, to this council. I suppose we've we've reached uh, in the last week. It was actually last Sunday, um, a, quite a milestone um, uh, in the overall Northern Ireland program. Um, the uh, um, the two million dose mark was met, um, and uh, also eighty percent of the population of Northern Ireland, the target population of Northern Ireland, so that's one point four million people. Uh, Eighty percent of those was was uh, would would have had their first dose vaccination now, so very significant. Within our own uh, trust program of de uh, delivery, um, we uh, are just about to hit uh, two hundred thousand doses. We're actually at one hundred ninety three thousand doses at the moment. Um, we've delivered one hundred and twelve thousand dose one vaccinations and 81,000 dose two vaccinations. So 81,000 people in the Western Trust area, well, were vaccinated in the Western Trust area are fully vaccinated at this point in time. 
Uh, one of the issues at the moment, and you'll see it in the press in England, and you'll see more of it in Northern Ireland, is uh, that uh, there are some difficulty reaching some of the age groups, particularly the younger age groups. And if any of you watch the vaccination dashboard, the Department of Health dashboard, you will see that um, in the age group of 18 to 29, uh, only 51% of that population has so far received their first dose vaccination. So uh, while we have three mass vaccination centres across the, the trust geography, while other trusts have, have one, as you know, um, there, there is a level now of reaching out to some target groups that has begun. Um, that is um, much more extensive in other trust areas simply because they have only one centre and therefore are not spread across the geography already. Um, but uh, we are certainly engaging with the public health agency and the department in some outreach. Um, so we have been given two areas by the public health agency which have particularly low output, sorry, low uptake of the vaccine. And those are Craigan and Chantalo uh, in Derry. Um, and we have vaccinated uh, in one of those areas. And we're now looking at other, um, we, we call them outreach or mobile clinics. Um, and those will be in areas where uh, the PHA is particularly concerned about the uptake of the vaccine. Nothing is as yet identified in the Fermanagh area, but it's being kept under review. Uh, there's a small number of outreach clinics. Um, so as you can see, we've started uh, also testing uh, the walk-in approach. Uh, and we had the first walk-in clinic in the Foil Arena on the 29th of June. So it was on a Tuesday evening this week um, uh, from five o'clock to eight o'clock. Um, and we had good uptake as a result of that. And the department and trusts are all now considering uh, what they wish to do in relation to developing that um, model of delivery of the vaccine through a walk-in model. Um, and we will have additional outreach programs um, at clinics over July. So really the uh, plan is that we deliver as many as possible first dose vaccinations of Pfizer or completely Pfizer now in our centres um, by the end of July and to keep up with all of the second doses which are scheduled to be delivered um, right out and through to September. And beyond that, we ha have no confirmed plans with the Department of Health. We meet with them on a weekly basis at least um, and it is a very changing picture so we're all very agile and very used to being asked at short notice to uh, to support and deliver the vaccination programme with new ideas and new tests to ensure uptake is as good as possible. Um, Geraldine, I'll finish at that. Thank you, Teresa. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to just provide you with a, a short update on where we are with on schedule care and ED pressures and elective care. So um, I think it's fair to say that um, attendances across our emergency departments continue to rise post COVID. Um, the pressure has been felt right across the system and you will see this from a lot of the media coverage um, that continues uh, regarding on schedule care. At Alton Galvin, um, would there's been a 5% increase in attendances. So we're up by about 20 to 30 patients per day attending, particularly um, Days of most pressure are Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then it eases off towards um, the end of the week. The increase in attendances have been reviewed, and in the main, they are category one and two patients, which are very complex and sick patients. So their attendance is very much appropriate. We have also seen um, an increase in our unscheduled admissions by 3%. And in that con context, um, I think it's important to say that our length of stay has decreased, which means patients are moving through our, our hospital systems a lot faster than they were pre-COVID. In Southwest Acute, we have had had a 17% increase in our attendances. So there we're seeing um, attendance increase of about 40 patients per day. Again, there's high volume days, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, beginning of the week and again replicated right across the system. We have also seen a 20% increase in on schedule admissions and again our length of stay for patients is on the downturn. Um, the, the attendances there have been reviewed as category four and five which are minor ailments and non-complex patients. 
Um, there's been a system approach, a system wide approach to to reviewing the pressure and overseeing the pressure. We have daily regional calls um, in place with all trusts involved um, at senior management level um, with actions agreed of how we support each other in terms of um, ambulance turnaround and high volume attendances. There's twice weekly, weekly director meetings um, around the, the uh, strategic review and planning pre-winter. And we're also reviewing our hospital early morning scoring systems and our escalation plans for the winter. Um, in the middle of all this, we're maintaining uh, COVID and non-COVID pathways. And I think it's important to note as of today, we have four positive patients on the Galvin site. And we have no positive patients on Southwest Acute site. And you'll all be aware of the minister's priority around no more silos. So we continue to prioritise reducing the footfall at our emergency departments and enhancing services at Oma Hospital and Primary Care Complex and Urgent Care and Treatment Centre. So in that vein, we are prioritising a rapid access to specialty and our um, ambulatory care pathways for our GP colleagues to refer directly into the service. And we also, um, as you know, have implemented um, at this stage um, hospital at home services in the southern sector. And um, at this point, we're waiting for funding for the year ahead to be confirmed, and that has not been confirmed as yet. So that's the position around um, on scheduled care. And then in terms of the elective care uh, position, so the ministers recently um, launched document, the elective care framework, uh, restart recovery and redesign. Um, I think it's available for you all on the Department of Health well website. And um, for your understanding, I think um, the minister has launched this roadmap to in an attempt to tackle our waiting lists across Northern Ireland. Um, he has proposed short term, medium and long term actions. Um, I'm just going to pick out a few of those for your information today. So um, by March 2026, no one should wait more than 52 weeks for a first outpatient appointment, an inpatient or a day case treatment or 26 weeks for a diagnostic appointment. He also pledged to, to close the demand and capacity gap by March 2026. By this he means, and um, because of the the increasing demands on the services across the region in terms of, of um, elective care, and the the capacity that's available to deliver that, um, there is a huge gap there in between the demand and the capacity. So what he has asked um, in this document and what he proposes is that we support staff to deliver high levels of in-house elective care by introducing enhanced rates for staff for targeted shifts so that they can work across the seven day period. He proposes to lease theatres to the independent sector partners um, to try and close the gap between demand and capacity. Um, and as I say, it includes evening and weekends across seven day period. And we hope to have a plan for that by December 2021. Um, I'm just going to speak very quickly on orthopaedics because he does outline orthopaedics as a as a, a specialty um, within the document. So um, I'm sure you all know I'm the manager chair of the Northern Ireland Orthopaedic Network. And I suppose at this time the network is committed to um, maintaining virtual outpatient activity at a high level. We're leading the development of mega clinics by September 2021. And we've already uh, tested this concept across um, the Western Trust geography, particularly being delivered at OMA. Um, and we also are pulling together a recovery plan for orthopaedic inpatient and day case treatments um, to present to the minister. Um, other mega clinics included in the document are cataract assessment, pre-op assessment and breast assessment and expansion of day case and inpatient elective care centres, which have been tried and tested now, particularly day case, are a proposed way forward within the document as well. All of this, he proposes, will be supported and overseen by an elective care management team, and he hopes to have that in place early in the autumn. Um, I suppose the main highlight um, of the document, as I said, and, and the full document is on the Department of Health website. Um, locally, I think it's important to point out that um, 
we continue with our tests of change to try and reduce our waiting times for patients. I've mentioned the medic mega clinics, the foot and ankle uh, service that we had started, and we will continue that. And we're also working with some independent sector um, colleagues, partners around how we might um, use our vacant capacity across the sites better as we go forward. Um, I'm just going to ask Teresa if she wants to add anything around our rebuild services um, in terms of, of our current capacity and what we can deliver in the next quarter. Um, thanks, Geraldine. Uh, I suppose just to say uh, in general um, um, to council colleagues, uh, we've been proceeding quite well against the rebuild plans, which we have submitted to the Department of Health. We're still not in some services fully back at the pre-pandemic levels. And I think that's not unexpected given the uh, control that are required around some of the um, service delivery models to prevent um, infection and transmission of um, um, COVID. However, we are within, for example, our outpatient services currently um, sitting at something like 87% of um, the pre-pandemic levels. Um, and we're uh, proceeding very well, actually, in some of our community services to get right back to the level that we were before the COVID pandemic. But Geraldine, there'll be a formal report to our trust board, which is always available to the public, as you know, um, and that will be happening next week. Um, and perhaps some of the information Chris could share then uh, after trust board it completes. Thank you. OK, so we're going to move on to uh, an update on our mental health service. This is from Karen. Good afternoon, everyone. There is also a detailed brief that goes along with this, these slides. So I'm just going to briefly just cover some of the services and what's been happening with us in mental health at this point in time. As people would be aware, our mental health services have been under some pressure throughout COVID, but since we're moving out of COVID, it again has become quite pressurised, especially the overcapacity in our hospitals. However, we continue to strive to get our services back up to pre-COVID levels. And one of our main areas that we're working very hard on, not just locally, but regionally, is our alcohol and drug service. The community services are fully operational. And as people would be aware, our ASH centre is eight beds. We have seven of those beds up and running with the eight bed that we need to use for isolation of COVID patients, should that be required. Our primary care liaison services at NOMA, the current waiting times are within the regional standards of 10 days for an urgent appointment and nine weeks for routine appointments. Fermanagh primary care liaison has reduced its breach position to 31 patients waiting outside the nine week target. And that's significant for us because we did have a significant waiting list that were outside the targets for some time. Our token therapies in our OMA and in a, in a scale from an area are very much being looked at under our Pathfinder. And we hope to work with the GPs to look at how we can develop and ensure that this works for the community. Our psychological therapies, we currently have a, a significant waiting list, but we have begun in the, in the Western Trust to look at an improvement project around this, to look at what we could do differently together and also looking at how we work. Um, right across the voluntary and community sector to enable us to reduce the waiting times and the waiting list for our patients in this area. Chris, the next slide, please. Our personality disorder service, which again is another significant service, the DBT work continued throughout COVID and as a central service provision, it's now virtual and works very well on that platform because we can target, as you can see, um, a groups and quite a number of people. And our eating disorder service and the regional trauma network, bereaved by suicide service, they all remain open and operational. Our recovery services remain open across the trust. And what we are moving to much more of is a return to face-to-face -face encounters, which our patients and our service users really benefit from. Our recovery college continues to develop from the trust and it's based at Listener Mullard and that's doing some really great work online and right across the community. And our hospital and crisis service continue to manage increased demand and complexity. And as people will be aware, we've had a visit from the minister both to our Grangewood Hospital and to our Elm and Lyme Hospital. And again, it's been able to demonstrate that albeit we have significant challenges in overcapacity, 
it is still everybody working together to get the best outcome for our patients so that they can go back to their homes and flourish. We were made aware at our last visit from Elman Lyme by the minister that he would be investing another 400,000 again into our Elman Lyme hospital. We do recognize that Elman Lyme is an old hospital and most definitely for all of us here is that we do want our new hospital. In saying that, whilst we wait in the new hospital, this money will be invested as any other money has been into making sure that this hospital is safe, it's open and it's well for all the patients that come into it. So albeit it's £400,000, that £400,000 will be used specifically in Elman Line Hospital in OMA to ensure that it is as up to date and as safe as we can possibly make it. So across our hospital, our mental health liaison services are continued to be developed across our acute hospital sites. And again, that's a new development for us and one that we hope to continue to work in our acute services with. And then obviously we have the mental health strategy, which people would be aware was published this week and it's from 2021 to 2031. And I suppose it's a roadmap map for the next 10 years and obviously the funding plan for the implementation. And this is a significant strategy for all of us. And it's one that we all welcome. And I have no doubt it's one we will all be paying quite a bit of attention to. And myself, I sit on some of the work that comes out of the strategy and that's work on looking at a single mental health service for the region to begin to standardize and begin to make sure that the pathways into each service are the same across the region as opposed to different across different trusts. So thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I'm just checking you can all hear me okay. Um, Chair, sorry, just before we move to questions and answers, I just want to cover one of the members' queries that wasn't included in the presentation, if that's okay. Of course. So that's around the query regarding CPR training and availability of defibrillators in the Western Trust area. So, <clears throat> so all Western Trust staff have access to CPR and defibrillator training as appropriate to their level of experience and to meet their clinical responsibilities, either via the resuscitation service or CPR's cascade trainers. There are only a small number of areas outside the trust um, outside the hospital setting, uh, such as health centres, treatment rooms, and the three mass vaccination centres that have uh, an automatic defibrillator. Um, there are a number of community and voluntary organisations, however, on the back of the Christian Eriksson um, collapse that are now offering CPR training, awareness training, and certified training. And there are defibrillators in town centres and key areas right across the Western Trust geography. Um, NIAS also, our Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, have um, access to a number of defibrillators across our job tree area as well. So there's quite a lot uh, there for people to access if they're trained to do so. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you for, for that overview there um, to the director. Thank you for, for taking the time today to do that um, with members. Um, I noticed that there's a few hands up. Um, I know mentioned there at the start, Geraldine, um, you'd said about any items that may need to be um, in confidential. I, I don't envisage that that'll be the case, but certainly if that is during the, the members' questions, you can advise. Um, we will take a note here in the town hall and we will deal with them under the confidential section of the, the business today. So um, I'll take Councillor Warrington first, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for everybody for that report. Uh, it's good to see a wee bit of positivity. Uh, I just want to go back to the vaccine. Um, and obviously, uh, well, from a personal perspective, uh, I see this vaccination uh, programme as our uh, road out of COVID. And I, I think that can't be sort of um, talked about enough. Uh, we had a meeting uh, about 10 days or fortnight ago with the PAJ as well. And I suppose that one of the concerns is here is the younger generation that's been highlighted here, um, the 18 to 30s, um, who to a degree 
uh, the majority of them probably think that they're immune to COVID, and and even though they do get it, they can they can uh, shake it off quite easily. Um, uh, but I think we need to look. Uh, certainly, we need to look as a council, and we've spoke to the PHA about this. How we can can uh, encourage that age group to to get the vaccination. Um, because there's obviously there's still some degree of negativity surrounding the vaccination, and it's also good to see uh, that from this weekend there is, um, which will suit that generation maybe uh, a bit better. There's the the pop in the 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 cropping up. I think mostly this weekend they seem to be uh, in the South Down area, but it's good to see that. Um, that these walk-in centres are, are popping up, and hopefully they will will help to encourage the younger people to to go in uh, and get it. Because obviously numbers, I'll not say concerning, but the numbers are obviously uh, is quite high at the moment. There's 300 plus uh, infections every day for about the last three or four days. Uh, I know, fortunately, the, the hospital admissions are still low. Unfortunately, there was one death today. Uh, but I think we need to come up with some sort of ideas how we can encourage, certainly over the coming uh, July and August, how we can encourage the, uh, that age group to come and get the vaccine uh, and, and basically before the autumn time again, when, when obviously things have the potential, unfortunately, have gone downhill to the degree. Thank you. Teresa, do you want to take that question? Well, just to say, um, just to say, absolutely, uh, Councillor Warrant, and anything that the council can do, uh, in collaboration with the PHA, to encourage all of the citizens to uh, go, come to our centres to receive their first dose vaccination, I would very much support and appreciate that. Um, PHA have been working with us on various models, um, and I suppose we're still trying things that might work for the younger age group. Um, so we are arranging, for example, um, at the uh, Millennium Forum on the 8th of July that we will do a, a pop up or static clinic close to Premark. Um, so um, different things are being tried in different areas um, and we it's, uh, you know, it's we're all hugely invested in ensuring that we get the, um, the uh, vaccination rates in this uh, younger age group up. Um, if you if you do look at the spread of vaccination across the age groups, um, you know, 60 plus is 100 percent vaccinated now, uh, 50 to 59, 90 percent vaccinated, 40 to 49, 81 percent, and then 30 to 39, 66 percent, and then it drops obviously to the last, the last age group to 51 percent. So there may have been a level of uh, vaccine hesitancy in the older age groups. We I think um, uh, understand that, that that could have been a factor in um, uh, in the lower uptake, and we are now offering Pfizer in the three mass vaccination centres as uh, our first dose vaccination, and obviously everyone will complete as well their second dose with Pfizer. I think the other piece of learning is that in the one uh, walk-in clinic that we have tried so far, um, uh, we did have a very good uptake. Almost 50% of the people who attended were from the younger age group. So um, there's plenty still to do, and we'll certainly work with uh, um, our own teams to try to reach out as much as possible. But of course, councillor, um, the, the work that you can do on the ground and your representatives will be very important in this. Certainly, thank you. And I know councillors um, there that, that I have seen certainly on social media have been putting up that they've been getting the vaccine and things like that, which is important as well. Um, and for, for a lot of us, you know, that that's been the case and we've only been too delighted that, you know, we've had a brilliant uh, vaccination scheme here in Northern Ireland and um, that we were able to go locally to the Lakeland Forum and, and the, the same as uh, um, as everywhere else. You know, the, the local vaccination centres have been brilliant and very well uh, carried out as well. I was in and out in no time at all, so it was great. Um, but I see there Councillor McElduff has his hand up as well. Thank you, Chair, and uh, wish you well in the year ahead in your role as Chair. Um, it's great to see this subcommittee established and uh, just change in status really, but uh, it's a good thing. Um, I also want to thank our 
Western Health Trust uh, colleagues for addressing the issues that we have raised in members queries, you know, very specifically, uh, you know, very focused way. Um, I'm interested in all five, but I'm going to concentrate on the mental health agenda and my question. And uh, I think Karen said, whilst we wait on the new hospital um, and in the context of the launch of the regional health strategy, you know, um, we'll get on with it. And uh, there has been incremental investment from the department in Elm and Lyme, for example. I suppose I would welcome an insight or an assessment on the part of the trust as to where we sit with regard to achieving the new mental health acute facility or hospital in Oma uh, that has been promised for many years. Uh, it includes a 26 bed unit and all of that. But uh, I know it's not the trust that's holding it up. I know the trust has you know, been helpful in this project to date. But what is the trust assessment of the delivery of that from the department? And then secondly, there obviously has been an increase in mental health presentations, you know, quantitatively and also in terms of complexity. And I would like to hear more about investment in the recovery service. The recovery service, what has that led to by way of investment in the recovery service? And then just specifically in, in relation to addiction, what role does Ramona House play at this time in the addiction services? Thank you, Chair. Karen? Hey, thank you for that. As you would be aware, every opportunity that I can get and all of us can get with the minister, or anybody who will listen to us, we continue to push how important and critical it is for us to get our hospital in OMA. That is a, obviously a priority for us. Unfortunately, as you've seen and heard this week with regards to the Mental Health Action Plan, the Minister very honestly and openly said he wants to deliver on it, but he can't deliver on it unless he gets the money and he doesn't have the money at this point in time. So that again is with regards to investment even into our recovery services. So from our point of view is if we get the money that he is asking for to support the mental health strategy, then every penny that we get is invested back into our services and develop in our community services and not just our recovery services, but also our liaison with our community voluntary and independent sector as well. So that for me is a priority and one that we continue to push on. And as I said, I sit on the single mental health service work stream and I'm very much involved in looking at what we need here in the West. Mm. With regards to just getting our hospital, Again, it is waiting on the money to come through. But whilst I wait for it to happen, yeah. I still have got to run the hospital and make sure it's as safe as it possibly can be for the patients that we have. So at this point in time, I don't have an exact date of when or how. But what I can tell you is that every opportunity, right up until his last visit with us two weeks ago, he had from every one of us, a very strong indicator that as much as we will, as I called it, give Elm and Lyme a facelift, we still need the hospital to meet the needs of our patients. And I don't think it's gone off the priority list for anybody um, at this point. With regards to Ramona House, we have four beds in Ramona House that we will continue to use and work with. And there's much more detail on the briefing note um, on that. But again, another essential service for us in OMA and one that we will be continuing to support and develop over the next few years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, thanks the, the directors for their uh, briefing so far. It's just with regard to uh, Karen's uh, contribution, and obviously Councillor Michael Duff has already touched on it. It's an ongoing issue for quite a while. Whilst I do welcome the the update or the uh, facelift, as you have said there, Karen, with regard to Elm and Lyme, that is only a stopgap as far as I'm concerned. And uh, we were promised this phase two, the mental health uh, hospital in, in Oma, Oma, Oma Hospital and Primary Care Complex, phase two. So uh, I welcome what you've said. You've pushed the minister on this, and you've and anybody 
around you has been pushing the minister on it. I know from a political point of view as well, uh, my colleague uh, Tom McKellen, MLA, has been raising it in the in the assembly uh, with regard to questions to the minister as well. So uh, it would be great to get a timeline, some uh, very very shortly if we can, with regard to when is when is this going to be progressed. I would like to hear from that. And I know you can't answer today. You've already indicated that. But uh, certainly it's not been off my agenda or I'm sure any of the, the other Roman town councillors. Thank you. Thank you. And just to say for us, as you do know, it is most definitely a priority for us. And as soon as we become aware of the timescales, I will be sharing it so people will be clear as to how we're going to go forward with it. Thank you very much, Karen. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Dehan. Thank you, uh, Chair, and can I add my uh, congratulations to you on your appointment as Chair of this subcommittee and wish you every success in the upcoming year. Uh, Chair, I want to express my gratitude uh, to uh, the Western Trust directors uh, for giving us their time uh, this afternoon. We appreciate that very much and uh, the answers to our questions. And can I thank you uh, and all your staff for all the excellent work that you have carried out uh, over the last 18 months during a time of unprecedented challenge. Um, I, I welcome and congratulate uh, uh, the trust on the rollout of the vaccination programme, which has been uh, very, very successful. I have one question in relation to that. It's a question which I pose to the public health agency. Um, when we met last, didn't get an answer. You may wish to revert to me on this. Um, it is in relation to um, uh, uh, people who are resident in this area, but who are from abroad and therefore uh, not entitled uh, to um, NHS services and don't have a, a health and care number. Uh, I have one such case. Uh, a lady who would be anxious to avail of vaccination. Can I just ask for clarity regarding the position regarding non-UK uh, or European residents uh, living locally and their ability to access this vaccine even privately? I welcome the um, initiatives uh, um, announced by Minister Swan regarding uh, uh, addressing uh, very, very long waiting lists. Um, I welcome that. I appreciate the challenges. Um, I, I congratulate Minister Swan on the excellent work he has done during the pandemic. My question in this regard is what impact will these initiatives have on an already uh, stretched workforce? In relation to the mental health strategy, I welcome the publication of this report and uh, I look forward to taking some time myself to study it in detail. In terms of local delivery of mental health services, I really appreciate uh, the work that uh, our local staff uh, are doing, uh, which, and in particular the work of staff at the Toronto Fermanagh Hospital, uh, which is just excellent. Uh, my question on this section is in relation to um, services provided uh, in the area of child and adolescent mental health particularly um, on due delays in uh, the diagnosis of children with autistic spectrum disorder. And secondly, uh, in terms of provision of consultant psychogeriatric uh, services. And then um, uh, I wanted, I, I have lots of questions, but I, I just asked two more and leave it at that, uh, Chair. Um, the provision of acute care at home for the OMA area and also the provision of the talking therapy hub uh, for the southern sector. And finally, could I have an update on the refurbishment of the shell space uh, at Oma Hospital uh, and Primary Care Complex to provide the much needed additional uh, clinical space uh, for the GPs uh, in the primary care complex? Thank you so much for that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, um, Teresa, do you want to go first with the um, the non UK nationals, please? Response or have you got a response? 
Well, uh, if I can just say to Councillor D and Geraldine that um, there can be quite individual cases. Uh, I mean, we all understand the broad brush that if you're not a Northern Ireland resident and you don't have a GP, that you're not eligible. But for example, we have had situations where we have had people in Northern Ireland who have been unable to return to uh, their place of re residency and the department have um, made, a, made exceptions in certain particular cases. So I'm going to suggest, Councillor Dehan, that I get you the, uh, the query email, which is used for people trying to refer on these issues to the department and the department are very thorough at coming back and addressing the, uh, the queries of the individuals or their representatives. Um, so I think that's probably the most expeditious way to get an answer because there might be particular circumstances in the cases that, that, uh, that, that may be helpful, if I just mm -hmm. put it that way, that you, that you can't rehearse here. So um, the other part of the question was, can you get the vaccine privately? And you can't. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I would recommend the contact with the department. So Chris, if you um, talk to me afterwards, there's, a, there's an email address which is used for this. OK. OK, um, I'm, I'm just going to take the question around the elective care and the already uh, the impact on the overstretched workforce. And I suppose <laughs> in terms of a rebuild, first of all, um, Councillor Deacon, um, we made it very clear to the department when we were submitting our plans that we needed um, to continue our psychological support for the health and well-being of our staff members and um, the need for rest and recuperation. So that was all built into our, our rebuild plan, which is why we're still at, a, at the percentage trees I referred to earlier in terms of delivery locally within trust geography. Um, I think it's important to say that there has been um, increasing recruitment um, for additional nursing posts and Bob might want to give an update on that. And Karen Hargan, our director, uh, our new director of HR is there as well in terms of, of where we're at with bringing those people into post. So um, there's quite a number of our new uh, newly qualified nurses who have opted to work in the West. And um, I'm just going to quickly hand over to Karen or Bob if they want to pick that one up just in terms of the nursing piece, first of all. Geraldine, uh, Karen and Bob actually had a Karen had to leave the meeting and Bob couldn't join yet. So apologies for that. So if there is any inquiries again, if you want to uh, come back to any, come back to me. Yeah, so I, I suppose what I know at the minute is um, that we are expecting to come into post about just over 100 new recruits, um, Councillor Deehan, and with there's they'll go through a mentorship program and they will be available then to um, go into the areas of highest need. Um, going forward to deliver on our elective care framework that the minister has set out for us. Um, and it's the same with all professional groupings, the importance of the rest and recuperation and ongoing psychological support is our priority. Um, Karen, there was a question for you around um, mental health services again. Thanks. <clears throat> With regards to child and adolescence, it may be Bob, or sorry, Tom can pick up yeah, on yeah. the child and adolescent mental health services, but just to answer the question with regards to the psychological therapy hub in um, Fermanagh or West Tyrone, that work has been taken forward through our Pathfinder with our GPs with the view to getting that established in our primary care settings so that we can work collaboratively to begin to target levels one and two, tier one and two, for those that need that service. So hopefully over the next year, we will start over the next few months, we'll start to get a better update on how that's progressing. Thank you. Thank you. And then just in terms of acute care at home, um, before um, maybe Tom wants to come in first, do you Tom, or in the adult home? Um, maybe and, just in relation to Councillor Dehan's uh, comments about uh, CAMS. I mean, just in relation to Karen's comments about the pressure that Adult mental health services are under uh, children's mental health services continue to be under quite um, extreme pressure at the moment. Um, and what we're finding is that, and we're, we're just beginning to learn maybe the impact of COVID and, uh, you know, what are the issues in relation to emanating from lockdown and young people not being at school, etc. Um, what we are finding is that uh, we are having more young people with. Um, 
quite acute illnesses that, that uh, need uh, hospital admissions. And we have a regional uh, facility in Beechcroft at the moment, which is, which is full. So it's really, and and I, I haven't been aware of that previously in my career. So, and we have a number of young people from the West uh, there. Um, and again, I've not known that uh, number previously. Uh, so in relation to, to CAMS, we are, CAMS in general were under quite, uh, were pr quite pressurized. In relation to the autism uh, issue, Councillor Dehan, um, I mean we are very much aware of the of the uh, the demand on, uh, on autism uh, services and the uh, our capacity to meet them, and we are actively you know trying to trying to do so. I would just refer you back in relation to rebuild the Geraldine's comments about the uh, about trying to support staff with leave, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But albeit that, just to give you some idea of the uh, of the autism. Processes. I mean, we're we're triaging referrals for assessment and intervention, which we which we will continue to hopefully prioritise. Uh, we we will continue to review priority uh, and routine cases, liaise with families, review self-directed support, um, psychological and family support intervention. We'll continue to prioritise families in need. But I don't want to really go on, go on there, and 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 but you know we we are looking at it. We we have. Um, COVID has presented some difficulties for us, Councillor Deacon, as you're probably aware of in your professional uh, uh, role, uh, and that trying to assess uh, young people with, with masks, et cetera, et cetera, and trying to adhere to COVID regulations has been quite difficult. But we are moving forward in relation to that, and we're doing a blended approach in relation to face to face assessments and more sort of uh, digital uh, assessments. And we're looking at our, you know, post diagnostic diagnostic intervention. So it's not just a matter of trying to diagnose these uh, young people quicker, but we're looking to see what our, our our intervention services are. So, I mean, just to try and give you some reassurance without getting into a whole scream of stuff or screed of stuff, is we are actively uh, we are actively looking at that and aware of the capacity issues in relation to meeting the demand. Thank you. Um, so the acute care at home piece, we're going to have to come back to you with um, because Bob is not on the call, as Chris has said. So we'll get a brief and an update on that for you, Councillor Dehan, and and maybe the same for the shell space trees. I'm not sure if you have an update on yeah. that or not. Or you well, I, I think that I, yeah, I think that um, just to say, I think we corresponded recently with the GPs, Councillor Dehan. I think Anne before she retired about a month ago. So, Chris, if you want to check with the chief executive's office mm -hmm. uh, in relation to that response, it did talk about the good working relationships and some of the, uh, re the different uses that we'd made of the original design. Um, but also acknowledged that um, we have ahead of us primary care MDTs uh, that we have to take account of. So uh, it was it was really about working together on on all of those issues. But I think if chief executives content, we could share the letter. Councillor Dehan, um, thank you. And that might, might might set the position out well. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I think Councillor Campbell's next to see a wee button councillor there too beside you, Glenn. So you're yes. multitasking today. <laughs> Get a bit of help today, indeed. <laughs> so I did. Um, Go no, ahead. Thank you, Chair, and uh, and wishing you well in your term um, on this committee. Um, I suppose uh, I appreciate the comments from Karen in relation to the improvement of uh, mental health services in OMA and across the district. Um, it's you know it's obviously we don't doubt the commitment of the trust in that regard, and we also know that that the pandemic itself has brought that issue to the forefront, and that that mental health, as we all know, affects people right across the spectrum. But I want to focus just on uh, the, the older people um, in this query, really. And it's in relation to the, the return of, of daycare centres, which is welcome. Um, maybe it has been in, uh, limited in terms of um, the numbers, et cetera, but uh, I know that some um, older people will have returned, but others won't because they'll be uh, nervous about COVID and the implications uh, of that and the risk involved. Uh, and others that have returned, uh, I would guess, um, although the trust will know better than me and the people working will know better than me, but I would guess that uh, 
the period without those valuable services has maybe resulted in deterioration of their health. And I wonder, was there any plans really by the trust to try and address that those two two issues? I suppose the the older people who who won't return perhaps at this stage to those uh, valuable services, and those that have returned and maybe are um, have suffered as a result. And I suppose I, I'm honing in particularly on older people because I feel that they have been particularly vulnerable because they haven't been able to maybe do the same things maybe that other people could do to mitigate against. Uh, the impact on their mental health if they have uh, an issue with mobility or if they are, you know, uh, isolated. Uh, so I just wanted your some of the thoughts on that. Perhaps Karen, thank you, Chair. I'm I'm more than happy to take this um, with regards to our day centres because the issue applies right across the lifespan for those that utilise our day centres, whether it's mental health or learning disability or physical disability or, you know, our young people or older people. And we have been in conversations continually with the PHA to look at how we can continue to increase the capacity, taking into consideration that we are still in COVID. They are the most vulnerable people, whether they are older people or they are adults with learning disability or mental health. They are their vulnerabilities are increased because of either their age or because of their mental health. So we are mindful of the infection prevention control. We're mindful of the space that we utilize. And we've also as a trust began to look at how we do things differently and outreaching from our day centers into people's homes or also encouraging the use of direct payments to do things differently where even our older people or our young adults with a disability can actually go out to other activities that might not necessarily be just a day center. I do think we've got to look also at our opening hours our how we're working evenings, weekends, all of those are in the mix at the minute. And the PHA are working alongside us currently to look at the um, the distance, the two meter distance. We're looking at infection prevention control. We're looking at the transport, which is a significant aspect of how we get our people to our day centers. But we're also really mindful of the impact of isolation and people not having company or not seeing um, people. So it's weighing up the risk. And is the risk greater of people remaining in their homes and their mental health being impacted on by isolation and non-stimulation or not getting out? So this is an everyday conversation. And what we aspire to do is how do we as a trust continue to do it differently? But how do we work with the PHA to be able to get an outcome that works for everybody? So just to let you know that this is something that we are trying to find a solution that is the safest, especially for that most vulnerable group. And I would speak for Bob as well from older people on that very same issue because we collaborate together to look at how do we do this and how do we increase the capacity and how do we make sure everybody is safe more importantly so i hope that's useful thank you chair no that's certainly certainly reassuring and i uh, appreciate it's not an easy and uh, none of this is easy in terms of decision making so i wish you you and the team well with that thanks chair and then next is John Coyle, Councillor Coyle. Uh, thank you, uh, Deborah. Um, and wishing you well as your chair of this subcommittee. Uh, and uh, thank you to the trust uh, officials for giving us the presentation. Um, I have just a few points and maybe questions. Um, I welcome the rollout and all the you know the vaccinations that have been given. Uh, I did see on your social media, Adam B. Uh, you know, uh, a young influencer uh, on, you know, social media uh, that was put out on your feed, but, um, and that's encouraging young people for to take up the, encourage them to take up the vaccine. Uh, I was wondering if you, uh, you know, would carry that on uh, into the future or, you know, in the next uh, couple of weeks for to, you know, encourage as many people to take it up. Um, I got my vaccine in my local pharmacy, so I was, uh, you know, helping out in uh, the, uh, you know, our rural pharmacies because they have played such a vital role as well as, you know, trust staff in vaccination centres. Uh, mental health, uh, Karen, just about, um, I support the uh, unit in OMA. Um, I think it'll be beneficial when it does come, um, but I just... With um, the increase at emergency services, is the uh, the services there to catch those people that you know turn up uh, with mental health issues? 
is those at the emergency departments, both in Acknagelvin and at SWA, um, so that people don't, because uh, I think it's usually weekends that maybe people do turn up, um, you know, that are feeling lonely or have, uh, you know, mental health uh, episodes. Uh, and CAMs and adults, you know, the I have spoken about it before, the, you know, the, the change over from children and uh, adolescents to adults, and um, that that needs to be, you know, managed in a, a safe way so that when you reach, you know, adulthood that you're not uh, fall off the scale. Uh, during the pandemic, this last 15 months um, it has been really stressful for carers. Uh, and I don't know if, if he's had any uh, support mechanisms for them into the future. I think um, Karen had spoken about, uh, you know, money being paid, you know, for to uh, alleviate the stresses on those and that's welcomed. And I think question three in the, in the list was about, you know, regulations of primary care and GPs. Um, is that still paused at the minute uh, or is, is there changes to that? Because some members of my, uh, in my constituency were asking me that question. Uh, and we had seen in the media that, um, you know, the protection of staff at emergency departments um, and I fully condone, you know, abuse against staff. You know, they're there uh, protecting and uh, helping the public. Uh, and is there mechanisms there to protect them, you know, within the trust that, because uh, I don't want anybody, you know, any staff member being hurt. And that's all I have. And thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Dr. Paul. Um, I suppose just in terms of the uh, point three, I've already said that needs address with the Health and Social Care Board in terms of the um, primary care piece, because we don't control primary care, nor do we have any authority to make decisions on that. Um, the ED and at staff and the zero tolerance, we do operate a zero tolerance process in our ED departments right across all our trust facilities. We have very robust procedures in place um, and we, we use that um, and staff, we feel are protected as much as we can. Um, but that doesn't stop <clears throat> the abuse sometimes that they get within the departments, but staff are fully supported when they are. And, um, you know, we have we have very robust procedures um, in terms of, of investigation and managing that going, you know, if, a, if an incident occurs. Um, in terms of the, the mental health at ED and the tenses, we have crisis response and maybe Karen would like to say a wee bit more of that. We do have um, support for people who attend, um, but we probably could do better. Um, but um, I'm sure Karen will take that. Um, the vaccine encouragement, Teresa, I don't know if there's anything further to say on that um, from previous councillors. Um, well, we are putting um, photo booths um, so that uh, when we do a pop-up clinic, people can take a selfie, counsellor. Um, and um, so we're taking all sorts of advice about what might encourage, and I think all trusts are going to do this sort of thing, just to encourage the younger age group. Um, obviously, the uh, the influencer was our comms team's idea, and I think that's been very effective, and we obviously will continue to use any any sort of innovation that we can to encourage uptake. Karen, do you want to say anything? And you're all welcome to be social influencers yourself when it comes to the vaccine, if you want. Um, <laughs> there's some days I would like to take it up full time, social influencing. Um, but more importantly, with regards to our acute hospitals, we have the mental health liaison service at both hospitals, SWA and Altony Galvin. But we also have a crisis home treatment team which also reaches into the hospital, but reaches into people's homes also. And that is a significant service that hopefully we will begin to develop because we know how important it is. And it's also a service that is really important in helping us keep people very well at their homes and preventing people going into our acute mental health hospitals as well. So it is an area that is significant to the overall care of any of our service users or patients that have deteriorating mental health. 
Um, in terms of the Thank carers, you. we'll probably have to provide something for you, Councillor Coyle from Bob. Just um, word, and we can get a brief, Chris, if you make a note of that. And then Tom, just the transition within CAM. Sorry, you know, to Geraldine, I, to sorry, Geraldine, for interrupting. I can come in on carers with regards to even our carers in um, learned disability. You're absolutely right. It has been a really very challenging time for our carers and our day centres, as we've talked about earlier, would have been a short break for a lot of our carers that would that they didn't have. And we do have in learned disability what we call our local involvement groups, where we do have a very strong carers voice. And we also have our groups that look at how we are utilising direct payments and are we utilising it appropriately, appropriately to support our carers and service users in the community. We also have a trust carers group that is very well represented um, right across all the communities who are very strong in voicing what it is that they feel carers needs and how we do things um, differently. And I suppose the strength of that is how we work in partnership to make sure that we are targeting the right carers and making sure that our short breaks continue the way they need to. And also be mindful now as we go into the summer period and we have schools off as well, it's how we can continue to support our carers through what can be, again, another very challenging time. So they are a priority for us and we remain in conversation and partnership with them, both across, I suppose it's across all the lifespan that includes children, our adults and our older people as well. Thanks, Karen. Um, Tom, do you want to add anything around the transition? Well, just to say, um, uh, Councillor Coyle, in relation to the carers, I mean, we have funnily enough, uh, only in the last fortnight, I've pulled together a meeting with various staff in relation to young carers and ensuring that, uh, you know, we, we offer uh, assessments in an appropriate way, et cetera. So that's an issue that we are we are concerned about in relation to making sure that uh, it's young carers who are maybe looking after their mother or father, wherever it happens to be, um, you know, that we have a focus on them, as Karen quite rightly pointed out. Uh, in relation to the transitions, again, sir, I think you've been listening to some of our meetings, because in the last week, Karen and, and myself have met uh, just in relation to transitions, uh, you know, particularly in the in the CAMS disability field, um, in order to try and make sure that that transition is as smooth uh, as possible, but also that it's as, as open and transparent as possible, because some of the services in relation to the adult world and the children's world are somewhat different, and some of the responsibilities that we ha would have as a trust to children are somewhat different than we would have to adults. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that Karen and I have uh, have talked about is to make, make sure that uh, that the, the top priority is that whatever happens, that families are absolutely crystal clear of you know what services can be available and what, what the transition is. And then if there are any queries or questions, that we're able to do it, you know, in the transition process. So, as I say, those are a couple of things that um, th that we've actually been talking about. And just in relation to comms, comms contacted me uh, about being a young influencer as well, but they were about forty five years too late, so I had to pass it by. <laughs> but thank, thank you, Councillor Coyle, because those are very relevant questions. Uh, thank you. you know, which which we've which we've actually been looking at in the past fortnight or so. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I would be an influencer either. Like, uh, I wouldn't like to give up my day job. So, <laughs> well, uh, you, you look forty-five years young, younger than I do. So you're you have a good <laughs> chance. Thank you, Councillor Coyle. If I can just add something, we we have used the the networks that Tom's service leads and that those services would have to again promote uh, vaccination to our, our younger age population. So thank you, Tom, and to all his staff for the work that they've been doing to support this as well. Yeah, thank you, Teresa. Um, the, I'm getting my vaccination tomorrow morning again, so I'm for my second vaccine. So uh, it'll be going on social media and encouraging as much as like uh, Deborah has, you know, for to, it's, uh, it is painless, so, um, and it, uh, you know, it's just for the benefit of all of our society and uh, protection of uh, the most vulnerable. And thank you uh, for all your comments. 
thank you, John. I think we could be influencers, all right. <laughs> um, Glenn Campbell, Councillor Campbell, I see your hands up. Is that from the last time, or would you like to come back in? Councillor Campbell. Okay, I see there. Um, Councillor Warrington has just put into the chat that um, if if people could switch off their cameras, is it the internet struggling a wee bit? So hopefully that that might help things. Okay, and um, Councillor McElduff. I thought Deborah the can down. Sorry about that, Deborah. I I had raised a good number of issues in the members' queries, you know, and I'm glad just that we addressed each and every one of them individually, you know, that, that's the purpose of these meetings. So I'm content that and I will reflect on what has been said, Deborah, you know that one? Yes, <laughs> indeed, you. indeed. Mm -hmm. No, th th thank you. And um, thank you to the directors and the members there. I think that was a very um, useful and wide ranging discussion there on a number of different items. So uh, we appreciate that. So if we um, are now content, we'll we'll move on to the next item of, of the agenda, and that's item six to confirm a uh, schedule of future meetings. And um, I suppose uh, at this juncture, maybe uh, I know Neil uh, uh, is just into his post, and we congratulate him, and uh, we're we're very glad to see that um, you know that he's in the role. And so we would be quite keen, uh, I know myself as chair of, of the subcommittee, I'd be quite keen to invite Neil to the future meetings of the subcommittee um, in his role as chief executive. So perhaps that could be reflected um, in, in future meetings going forward. Happy to take that up to him. Um, Chris and I will have a conversation with him, um, chair, and we'll come back to you. Super. Thank you. The Chief Executive, would you like to come in there? Thanks, Chair. It's really just to remind members we should have a quarterly meeting schedule. Uh, obviously, that's been a little this a bit disturbed of late with some of the COVID um, responses, but we have dates now agreed, I think with uh, which suit Western Trust colleagues as well for October, January and March. So we will be issuing those at the start of next week. I think I'm working slightly from memory, Chair, but I think the next meeting will be Thursday, the 14th of October, but we will confirm those and issue them to the um, to the members early next week. That's Thank great. Thank you. And then um, moving on to the next item on the agenda is correspondence. And you will see that there's one piece of correspondence there from the Public Health Agency um, and a new chief executive has been uh, appointed to that role. Um, I certainly would be keen that we would also invite um, the new chief exec executive, Aidan Dawson, um, to your subcommittee. So um, I'll take members there, uh, Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Well, I concur with your comments uh, and welcome them and uh, would formally uh, propose that. Chair, I had actually wanted before we uh, left the previous item uh, to come in to say that I uh, uh, welcome uh, the Trust's um, information regarding training that is provided uh, regarding uh, CPR. And I know that Councillor McElduff in particular um, had been concerned uh, regarding publicising uh, the locations in the community of yeah. our defibrillators. Could I request, Chair, a propose and request um, that uh, on, on the Council Facebook page or through our social media outlets uh, that we advertise uh, um, the uh, locations of these defibrillators and also um, uh, the, the training opportunities that are available to community members in the use of defibrillators and also to make particular note that uh, f and a comment from a community member who under uh, recently has undergone such training at how simple it is uh, uncomplicated she found it to be and and would like that message to go out to the community so that the community are reassured that they can undertake this training and that they do then have the capacity to save lives. 
So could I propose that chair? Thank you. Councillor Dehan, I, I um, would agree with your proposal there. I think there's actually a motion that's coming before council um, next week in, in relation to this very issue. Um, I don't know, Chief Executive, if you want to come in there in relation to that. Well, Chair, just as you've indicated, very happy to take the, the proposal and the suggested actions. It is contained or elements of this are certainly contained within the motion and I'm conscious um, when the Council would have agreed a position on Monday evening, it would then have Council powers to proceed uh, where we, we would only have a recommendation from this evening's subcommittee. Certainly happy to record the proposals, Chair. Super, th thank you. Um, Councillor Coyle. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I will uh, second Councillor Deacon's proposal to invite Aidan Dawson to the uh, subgroup for uh, to meet us and discuss any items. And thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coyle and Councillor Bankeldoff. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Chair, again, public health agency, really important to engage with them on a wide range of issues. And I think one of the organisations, even though we've met them, that we least understand is the Health and Social Care Board. Now, on this occasion, administratively, I did submit those members' queries, and two out of the five are more appropriate, you know, the business of the Health and Social Care Board. And I would like an early engagement again with the Health and Social Care Board through this subcommittee to address the dental care strategy but also GP access and GP registration, because regularly I get phone calls from people who say, I've moved house and I was with this practice. Uh, they have let me go and there's no room at the inn in the new uh, practice in the area to which I've moved. And I'm, I'm at pains at the minute how to get back to a constituent uh, from mid Tyrone who wants an answer to that question, saying I've been let go by my previous practice and I'm not being accepted in the area. Uh, so we need to get to the bottom of that. And also this thing of, um, you know, people who are in the car parks of health centres and are handing up letters through a window and they're falling down on the other side, just a general feeling of inaccessibility. And at the same time, I understand there is an issue about recruitment and retention of GPs and the McGee University thing is, is a vital part of the solution. You know, so in the round, we need to have a discussion. And sometimes it feels like speaking truth to power because uh, people need our voices to say that they're falling through these various cracks. So I think we need an engagement as soon as possible and subject to your scheduling and the chief executive scheduling with the Health and Social Care Board. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Barry. So that's to propose um, that we that we meet and, and contact the Health and Social Care to, to meet with us. Specifically on those primary care issues and dental, dental and oral health as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I want to second Councillor McAdolf's proposal there. Uh, as it had been, we have had a great meeting today with the directors of the Western Health and Social Care Trust uh, through the subcommittee, and I would welcome. Obviously, uh, we've had we've had meetings in the past with the Health and Social Care Board and the GPs engagement as well. But you know, we can never let the, leave these off the shelf. These things have to be dealt with as well. So we need to get those uh, organisations and on our meetings as well. So happy to second. Thank you, Chair. Perfect. Thank you. And everybody in agreement there that we um, meet with the public health agency, the, the new chief executive, that uh, we we also advertise on the Facebook page the locations of the defibrillators and training, and also that we extend an invite to the Health and Social Care Board as well. Everybody in agreement with those? Agreed. Agreed. Sorry, Chair, just for clarification. Um, and uh, apologies to Councillor, uh, Councillor Michael Duff. I, I hadn't been aware of his uh, motion. Uh, the point really that I wanted to make was the ease of use of defibrillators because and, and uh, you know, the training 
uh, that uh, is available out there. So it's really the the training uh, opportunities and uh, uh, how how easy this training is. Uh, I think that's a message that needs to be got out. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And I, I suppose um, we will be discussing it further then um, next week in, in our full council meeting as well, because it is a very important issue that's been brought very much to the fore recently. Um, so it's important that we do um, make people aware in the public, um, the locations and, and everything as well, and the ease of news as well. It's it's vitally important. So thank you for that. Um, just I suppose that another um, Another thing that I would like to to maybe do on behalf of the subcommittee, if everybody was in agreement, we we know that uh, Uncle Gallon has retired, and I think it would only just be right that uh, on behalf of the subcommittee that we um, write to her and and just wish her well in her retirement. If if everybody was in agreement with that as well, Councillor Thompson. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair, again and. I would be happy to propose such, and also in my my role as chair for Milan Nova District Council, I would uh, want to host a reception to acknowledge uh, Dr. Anne Kilgallen. Uh, she has retired, and all this has been done in the past with the past chief e executive of the trust, and I think Kieran Downey was also recognised. So uh, I I will be prepared to do that in the not too distant future, hopefully maybe within weeks so happy to propose that here great thank you uh councillor thompson and councillor coyne yeah i'll second that and i thank the chair of the council for uh you know having a reception for Anne because uh, we would like to wish her well in her retirement definitely Th thank you Okay, members, if, if you're content, we um, will move on. And uh, the next item is any urgent or relevant business. I don't think any has come come through. So um, then the, the last item on the agenda is um, any confidential business. And I don't think that there is any. So um, just all that's left for me to say is to thank again the uh, directors for joining us uh, today and to thank the members uh, for what has been a very useful um, and uh, productive meeting today. Um, and we look forward to October um, when we'll meet after our our summer holidays, hopefully, um, and we'll we'll meet again in October. So all the best and a uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Deborah. Bye. 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 Thank you, Chair, Bye. trust officers, and have a nice weekend. You too. Bye. 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 Thanks, Deborah. Bye. Bad broadband today. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>